Hello everyone, we are today at the Panzermuseum Munster and we'll talk about sloped armor, particularly about the myth that like the Soviets invented sloped armor and nobody knew about it or that the Germans only started to use sloped armor after the Soviets. Um, well, this is a Sonderkraftfahrzeug 52 and it uses, as you can see, sloped armor and the first, they put, the first time they were put in service was in 1939. T-34 saw the first action in 1941. So there's already a problem. Then if you look at the French, at their, one of the infantry tanks, the FCM, was produced from 38 to 39 and saw combat in the Battle of France in May 1940 and June against the Germans. So it's rather obvious that the Germans knew and ran into sloped armor before. But there's the issue that Panzer III, Panzer IV, also the Tiger, all have boxy armor, non-sloped. Then suddenly, with the Panther, after the T-34, their sloped armor comes up. So it, it kind of seems to be, well, was there some influence? We can assume that there was definitely an influence with the sloped armor. So Hitler requests sloped armor for the future King Tiger, basically, at one point. And this is likely due to experience with the T-34, but German tank production and tank designers specifically used the boxy design for specific reasons and because they wanted to use it. And if you look at the various armor and the sloped armor, of most, especially for the German heavy tanks like, the, like the, the Panther, the King Tiger, but also the Jagdpanzer IV, you see they did something very different. Speaking of different, here is a word from today's sponsor, our own publishing house, which exists thanks to all of you. We have a new book coming out, namely Achtung Tiger by Peter Tank Archive Samsonov. It looks at the tiger's survivability on the battlefield from a Soviet and Western Allied perspective, using primarily original sources from the time period. To celebrate the occasion, from 23rd April to 5th May 2024, Achtung Tiger is 15% off, whereas all our other books are 10% off. Also keep in mind that this is your last chance to get the limited edition of Tank Assault, the translated Soviet manual on tank combat, which will disappear from the store at the end of the sale period. After that, only the regular edition will be available. So this is your last chance to pick up the limited edition. So why didn't they go for sloped armor initially? And one point is structural integrity. So one weak point are the seams, the welding seams of a tank. And if you have the plates like this, if they get hit, there's only pressure in one direction. If you have it like a sloped armor, you have more stress in a different way on the seams. And you can see that the Germans were apparently convinced about it, that this was strong enough because it seems for the Soviets it worked. So I don't exactly know, I don't know the physics behind it and the calculations, if it actually was necessary because the Germans did something different. For this, let us take a closer look at German sloped armor and then compare it to sloped armor of the T-34 and the US M10 tank destroyer chassis. Now here on the Jagdpanther you can see these joints at the sloped armor and here also on the side. And this is in complete difference to what the Soviets would use because they would just have a regular plate here and a regular seam and not none of these joints. With the Panther this was the first time these joints with the cutouts were used for the welding. And you can see it here and there, the size here is not even. With, for instance, with the King Tiger, you will see it's an even joint. And here we have it as well at the frontal plate as well. To the Panzer IV. Now here with the Panzer IV, you can see it's just a straight weld. There's just one seam here and the same here at the frontal armor. Because this then, if a shot hits here, basically it, it it, it helps with the structural integrity. Okay, let's go to the T-34. 
And here with the T34 you can see in contrast we have a sloped armor but there are no, no joints like with the Panther. With just a straight weld over here. Let's now look at the T3485. Similarly, no interlocking or something, just a straight seam. Important additional information here. The T34 had some interlocking. The initial patterns of the T34 manufactured in 1940 and 1941 had some minimal interlocking, namely around the turret face, according to Francis Poem. Yet more importantly, there were T-34 sub-variants that are clearly visible interlocking in the armor plates, particularly models produced by the Stalingrad Tractor Factory and Factory 112. One of the biggest and most noticeable changes made to the Stalingrad Tractor Factory house was the new method of construction. On normal T-34s, the glasses and rear plates were simply bolted, then welded onto the side plates of the hull. But this was not the same case at the Stalingrad Tractor Factory. This was done in part due to the fact that hulls had stopped being shipped from Mariupol Meteorology Plant. Tanks originally began to roll out with interlocking front plates in October 1941. This was swiftly followed by interlocking rear plates. This method of construction was also done at Krasnoye Sormovo 112, but only onto the front plate. The interlocking plates construction was adapted to the appearance of new methods of welding the parts together and because it helped with structural integrity. These tanks can be referred to as T-34 STZ interlocking hull. Keep in mind, later on, these interlocking plates were discontinued. In comparison to German tanks, the interlocking of T-34 plates was less pronounced. Here you can see an approximation in blue of the interlocking frontal plate of the T-34. Also, the IS-2 had an interlocking on the lower and upper frontal glasses plates. Perfect. Now to the King Tiger. <laughs> now here with the Königsdiger you can see, in contrast to the Panther, now they are basically the same size. And this is basically how it was done in late war. So you can also see that the Germans adopted this technique also over time. So with the Panther it was the first one, and with the Königsdiger it was one of the last one, how it was done with these joint interlocked, basically, armor plates. And here you can see on the M10 from, I mean, this is a British gun, but it's basically an American vehicle. And here you can see there's also no joint. It's just a regular weld. If you look at one of the cheaper German late war designs, namely the Jagdpanzer 38, which is generally called Hetzer, we see a bit of a difference. Here you can see that the frontal armor plates that are welded with the side armor plates are not interlocked. Meanwhile, the upper and lower glasses plates use interlocking similar to the other German vehicles. The question is now, why didn't the Germans build interlocking armor plates with sloped armor in the first place? To cut out these rectangles from an armor plate, which is very strong and very thick, you need a special cutting process. And this was developed over time, and it basically allowed the Germans to cut 90% faster. So the, the time was reduced to 10% in the cutting time. And this was a major, major advancement in the industry and also allowed the Germans to increase their tank production later on in the war. Now, very important, be sure to watch this video to the end, because there's a second conclusion based on the additional information I received during editing, and it presents a very different view to the information presented so far. How useful was this interlocking of plates? Well, the German expert on the Panther, Mark Köhler, looked at various reports about the benefits and drawbacks of interlocking armor plates. There seems to be no real consensus about it, particularly the British reports are rather negative, and it was noted that this was an inefficient way of production while bringing no major benefits. Meanwhile, a German engineer who was a major figure in the German tank production during the war argued that these interlocking marmor plates prevented that there were major problems with the breaking of valves during the war. Interestingly, this engineer makes several negative remarks about British reports, noting about one, the English authors obviously did not know the basic requirements for German tank welding technology, so that their technical justifications can be related to English conditions. 
but not to German tank technology. I don't really have the time and resources to find out what is correct here, although what is without doubt is that after 1945 interlocking plates like seen on the Panther, Königstieger and others you have seen were not used anymore in large numbers. Although there were certain exceptions. For instance, the T-54 had interlocking lower and upper glazes plates for the 1946-47 and 1949 models. Thanks to Tankolat for this information. The question is why, Mark Köhler notes the following. It is certain that the main design features of the time were still valid in Germany decades later. A comparison of surviving drawings with sections for the Jagdpanther chassis from 1944 with cutaway drawings of the Kampfpanzer Leopard 1 reveals strong similarities, especially in the construction of the seam joints. However, mortising and interlocking of the armour plates was no longer used after 1945. The required ballistic properties were and are achieved without these measures thanks to further development of armour steels and welding technology. Which sadly does not really answer the question if there was a major benefit to it or not. Considering that most Soviet and Western Allied tanks worked mostly without it, this suggests that interlocking was not deemed as crucial enough from their perspective. So in summary, the Germans had good reasons not to use sloped armor from the very get-go and it seems that they needed basically the reassurance of these interlocking armor plates that they thought they could go forward with it. Sadly, I haven't found a document on this. I'm relying mostly here on the information provided by the director of the Panzermuseum, Ralf Graz, and also, of course, on the visual evidence. It's, it's rather apparent, you can see, they didn't just do this to increase, increase production time, apparently. And the question is, of course, the interesting question is, if it was necessary or how much the benefits were. But I'm not sure if anyone did any study on this so far, because funnily enough, in everything I read, it never came up anywhere. It's usually mentioned the Germans, yeah, did the boxy design. Maybe there were some post-war studies done by the Americans or British or the Soviets, but so far I haven't seen anything. And I don't know enough about post-war tank design yet, but as far as I know, it's generally not used anywhere. But if I'm wrong, well, let me know in the comment section. Well, we are not finished here, since well, I got some very interesting and new information on this topic and what I just stated might be wrong. So while doing additional research when editing this video, I also talked with Tankolat about this. He runs the sword armor block, by the way, so check it out. He notes that the appearance of interlocking of armor plates and sloped armor on German tanks might be just a coincidence. As far as I know, we have not found any German document that clearly supports the view that the Germans did not use sloped armor to do structural integrity concerns and that the interlocking put them at ease. As such, those views presented earlier might be wrong and just an interpretation. So what is Tankolat's view on the issue? He assumes it comes mostly down to a change or a lack thereof in armor design from interwar design to midwar design based on various changes that mostly surround the positioning and view of the driver. He notes that all tanks with a stepped front hull shape were designed this way because the requirement for armor protection was limited to bullets only, at least initially, and all of them used direct vision ports. If one looks at the early tanks with sloped armor like the Renault FT and the BT-5, they had a bulge in it that housed the driver. Similarly, if one looks at the M3 Lee, it has a sloped armor plate and for the driver, the slope is reduced that it is almost vertical again. He particularly notes that World War II tank design ultimately marked the death of the direct vision port and it started tanks relying entirely on periscopes for crew vision and many design details in hull shapes and cupolas were affected by this change. This seems also be confirmed to a certain degree by the writings of the German engineer that noted that Winkelspiegel periscope sites were a solution in design of armored hulls. Tankolat further notes that the Panther and IS-2 for 1944 were compromises, noting that in the Panther G the direct vision port for the driver was removed and similarly the IS-3 and IS-4 had none either. 
In his view, the disappearance of stepped Hal nose design was fundamentally a reaction to the enormous leap in firepower from all sides during World War II. Sloped armor and the removal of direct vision port was the answer. As such, the main reason that the Germans did not change to slope armor might not have been structural integrity, particularly noting that the stress on the valves etc. was not so much different from the boxy design to the early Panzers and the Tiger. Additionally, we should keep in mind here that there was a major shift in German tank design during the war. The pre-war tanks were generally weakly armored and a clear focus was on mobility, whereas firepower and armor came later. This becomes particularly apparent if one compares French and German tanks in 1940. Already in May 1941, so before Operation Barbarossa and encountering the Soviet T-34s and KV tanks, Hitler requested heavily armored tanks and a major increase in firepower. This shift is clearly reflective of the Tiger and Panther, where armor has become far more important in German tank design than previously. Yet back to the topic of why German sloped armor was introduced. Sadly, ultimately, I have to say I don't know. I mean, I learned a lot doing that video, but I'm still not sure. Although I was at one point, and then I started to ask too many questions. Big thank you to Tankolat, additional thank you to Francis Pollem, and also to Peter from Tank Archives for answering various questions about the interlocking armor plates regarding Soviet tanks. Also, big thank you to Andy behind the camera for helping out with filming and following me from interlocked plate to interlocked plate. Thank you to the Tank Museum at Boeington for inviting me. Big thank you to the Panzer Museum Munster for inviting me. Thank you for watching and see you next time. Bye.